Hey, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting our students to learn what we teach. And I am Rob Alvarez. I'm the founder of Professor Game and professor of gamification and games-based solutions at IE Business School, EFMD, EBS University, and many other places around the world. And if this content is for you, then please go ahead and subscribe to our email list for free at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Hey, engagers, and welcome back to another episode of the Professor Game podcast. And we have Scott with us today. So, Scott, are you prepared to engage? I am ready to go. Let's do this because we have Scott Province, who is an award-winning instructional designer, author, and speaker. His print, instructor-led, and web-based curricula have been delivered throughout the world and his sales and customer service trainees have gone on to receive multiple industry awards for their work. He has over a decade of instructional design experience as well as five years in VP and senior leadership roles. And his book on training gamification, Fail to Learn, was a number one Amazon hot new release. You can check out what he's up to next at scottprovins.com. And Scott, is there anything we're missing from that intro that we, we, we take off? That sounds wonderful and it just fires me up even more. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> Amazing. So Scott, having been a longtime listener to the podcast and having met quite a while ago, which we were discussing on the pre-interview chat, you probably know that I'm going to ask you about your day, your week. So how does that look like? We want to know what does it feel like to be Scott Province? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. What is a regular day? I back up even and say like, man, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what regular looks like in, in today's day and age and world with the speed of everything. And I would say the one exciting thing is that there's no such thing as, as regular. And I, I take that as a very good thing. So for my world right now, I am a full-time consulting as a learning and development expert, uh, instructional designer, gamification trainer. And that means every day is a little different. So I'm meeting with lots of people, everything from big tech to nonprofits, from training gamifiers to behavioral scientists. You know, one day I might be writing a curriculum script for a criminal justice population. Another might be back-to-back -back consulting meetings with people in behavioral science to the music industry, I would say the one through line is I really like building things. So even when I was <laughs> leading teams and supposed to be kind of delegating out the daily work, I love just getting my hands dirty. And so I'd always be kind of in the trenches with, with my team building things out. It's just my favorite thing to get around and play. Amazing. Amazing. That sounds great and exciting and varied as well as you were just discussing. So Scott, let's get to it. We would like to know of one of those times when you had a fail or a first attempt in learning, that time when you would call perhaps your favorite failure, especially when it comes to creating games or gamification. We want to we be there with you. We want to take those lessons away. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I write about this a lot more. You know, it's, it's actually a great subject center, the synergy there. Uh, in my book, Fail to Learn, I write a lot about the important role that failure plays in our lives, you know, both in a, from a personal learning perspective, but also how we can leverage failure as training developers, instructional designers to really use that and treat it almost like a game mechanic. And one of the stories that I tell in my book, absolutely my favorite failure story, I would say I, I wouldn't have called myself a big gamer for a lot of my life. I liked playing games, but maybe the problem was I was measuring my own game playing amount with my uh, younger brothers, who was a big gamer. Um, and so I always <laughs> thought that, oh, I, I kind of dabble here and there, but I'm nothing compared to, to Colin here. So a few years ago, I really wanted to get a little bit more involved in some online gaming, especially during COVID. And so I, I convinced my younger brother to play a game live with me. And it was one of my first person shooter games. And I still remember what we did. So we met up online and he drops me in this, this environment and he, you know, gives me all this gear. And I remember that moment when we, the level kind of opens up and I did what I thought I was supposed to do and kind of dropped into this war zone, whatever it was, as I ducked down behind this crate and I was kind of waiting to see what was going to happen. And I'd kind of poke my head up and then duck it back down and poke it up. And in the meantime, my younger brother just tore off into the distance and immediately gets, you know, gunned down by whatever, you know, enemies are out there. Then he responds next to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so scary. And he goes, oh yeah, that happens. And he dashes off again and goes in another direction and immediately gets gunned down again and responds next to me. And he's doing this over and over again. And I'm continually unwilling to pick my head back up out of this crate because I don't want to get shot. And 
you know, from a non-gamer perspective, that seems to make total sense. And what I eventually <laughs> learned after several iterations of this is who is really going to be in the better situation here? Me, who has explored absolutely 0% of this game, or my little brother, who's gone off and died probably 30 or 40 times at this point, but is learning a lot more about the environment. And for me, I had this big barrier around failing in a game environment. And it was this big lesson that Colin had to, my, my younger brother had to impart to me of, that's what games are for, Scott. You're supposed to go out and, you know, step on the wrong button or, you know, unpack a, a whole uh, enemy nest over here. And that's how you learn these things. And how else are you expecting to learn something if you're, if you're hiding behind this crate and trying to protect your little health bar? And that was something that I really tried to bring into more of my life and personal and professional world in general. And if nothing else, it helped me realize that maybe exposure therapy was really good for me. And so I've really started to play a lot more games and been okay with being bad at them, being multiply <laughs> killed multiple times with them. And I think that's a pretty good treatment plan is, is just playing more games and getting used to the idea of, of failing in a fun environment. Okay. So, so two things out of this story. I love the story, by <laughs> the way, um, especially that there's sort of Let's even take it to a specific game, for example, Fortnite, right? So mm -hmm. there's modes in Fortnite in which, as you were saying, suggesting you go in, you fall on the island somewhere, you know, within the storm, and or well, outside of the storm, actually, and mm -hmm. you get to, you know, face all these people and they probably eliminate you and you fall <laughs> right back in, right? Yeah. There's another mode, right? When you're on the, on the 100 Battle Royale thing, right, where, okay. you know, there's one person who ends up at the end and that's the winner. So it depends on what your objective is. If, if you're yeah. on the 100 people won, you kind of want to be a little bit more sneaky sometimes <laughs> depending <laughs> right. on your strategy, right? right? But you definitely get a lot more learning uh, yeah. by going out there and perhaps getting getting shot down. Um, <laughs> over and over again. Yeah. Over and over again. And, and there was another game, like when I used to play a long time ago, Counter-Strike, the original, you know, first oh, yeah. early versions of Counter-Strike right after it became came out of Half-Life. You know, uh -huh. you got shot down and then you had nothing to do. You, you just were just lying there and waiting for, you know, the, the game to start over <laughs> so right. you could play again with your team. So yeah. maybe you had a little bit of that on, on the back of your mind. As maybe well. that was just it. Sort of in your defense uh, <laughs> exactly. in that sense. Yeah. You know, it was one of the things that was so interesting about what you were bringing up to is, and, and I didn't I didn't learn this until I got into researching and writing this book, is that there's this whole term in the gamer industry called permadeath. And, you know, the end gamers out there kind of know what this is. But for non-gamers, if you play games and you, like Rob was just describing, you, you die and you re respawn and you die and you respawn over again, that's very common in a game. But there are some games where dead means dead and you don't get a save point, right. you don't get to go back, you know, you have to all the way start back over at the beginning of the game. And they call that permadeath to kind of clue in gamers that this is a very special way of dying and you really have to restart. And I remember researching for my book thinking, how cool of an industry is this where we have to create a new term to conceptualize death? Like how many times has that <laughs> happened in the course of human history, right? Where we've now, well, there's dead, but then now this is permadead and we need to really draw a distinction there. So I think we're onto something as a as a collective group here. I think we're in the right spot. <laughs> and and the, the question I had, the, sort of the, the subsequent question for me was, how has this influenced, you know, one of your designs? Is there any example where you say, well, you know, when I was doing this, I remembered this thing that I did and, and, and the respawning and, and giving uh -huh. it a shot. Or in my design, I decided to actually let people respawn very quick. I don't know. Has this influenced you in any way that, that you can comment on? Yeah. Yeah. I would say that, you know, ever since kind of learning this, I've really tried to incorporate, I treat failure as its own mechanic. Um, and, and this I would apply to whether I'm designing games or designing, you know, even just traditional training elements is really trying to think about the fail states and the failure environments and you know everything from the emotions people will be experiencing to the quote unquote cost of re-engaging and trying to really question myself and my subject matter experts and my leadership groups what barriers are we trying to put in place here and, and again games is a great example for getting people to understand this concept of failure because it's something that we kind of can collectively share. One of the things I'll do when I'm pitching to a C-suite or a leadership group and they're talking about the types of trainings they want to create is whoever's played the old Doom 2, like the mid 90s computer game, they had a mode called nightmare mode. And you know, very similar to what we're discussing, right? It's like, I wanna to go to like level 100, I want this really impossible mode. But what I love from nightmare mode is when you selected it, there was an extra screen that popped up that said, are you sure you wanna do this? The skill level isn't even remotely fair. 
and the pitch that I take from that, that I kind of bring back to leadership groups, training design groups, even if they're not doing a game-based training is what was Doom 2 doing such that they could actually have a warning pop up saying, you probably don't even want to do this. This isn't even remotely fair and people would still do it. So how can we create training materials that are so engaging that we actually would have to have a disclaimer saying, are you sure you want to do this? Like, we don't even think you'd, you'd enjoy it that much and have people clamoring for even more. There's something that we can unlock there as training designers that I think would really get us to that next level. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Food for thought for <laughs> sure. <laughs> so... Scott, let's actually turn it around and, and look for an example, a time of something that you would call a proud moment or a proud project, something you want to sort of show off. Again, whether it was on the first attempt or the nth attempt, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Uh, we want to be there with you. And, and perhaps if there are any success factors, any lessons we can take out of that experience, we want to be there with you at the ground level. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. One of the ones that comes to mind for me, um, and I, I think I maybe I'd, I'd kind of title this or, or place the, the theme on this and, and the idea that gamifying is more than what people often think it is. And at least for me, when I when I got first got into this industry, I, I thought that to gamify something or to make a game-based you know, solution required a very specific template so that I would have to be, you know, would have to have a narrative or would have to have an epic quest attached or would have to have X, you know, points, badges, elite, you know, these sorts of things that I thought had to come with a game. One of my kind of proudest challenges or success moments was recognizing that I can quote unquote gamify something even just by introducing a couple of game-based mechanics. And so uh, one of the projects I was working on, I was brought in as a consultant to develop a manager training and was given a list of kind of key tasks and manager topics for this group. And they run at a very traditional solution. So, you know, sit people in a classroom and, you know, we go through lectures and exercises, et cetera, et cetera. I convinced them to let me actually take their task and topic list and rather than just building out kind of the traditional materials, use those topics almost like baseball cards. And so I would put one topic on each little card and give this set of task cards to the manager trainees. And rather than treating it like a traditional training, I said, here's some tasks. I want you to organize these tasks in terms of your personal priority about which ones you prioritize first in your day. And then I want you to add, you know, 10 cards that you would write on your own of tasks that you think haven't been included in this list. And the reason I see it as such a success is not only was the engagement super high, but we actually were able to come back to our leadership group and say, yes, we did some great training, but here's what your frontline people are telling you about this role that maybe you didn't know. Um, so you had this list of things that you thought people needed to be trained on. Your own trainees have, they almost tripled the list of tasks that they do. And so this was great communication for between frontline people and leadership groups and saying, let's kind of treat this not just like a didactic passive training approach, but more of a conversation that says, here's what we're doing in our daily lives. Oh, and by the way, these top five tasks that you wanted us to do, we actually are kind of deprioritizing those in our daily work for these reasons. Um, and so it was a great conversation. And it really kind of boiled down to this game mechanic of card collection and matching and socialized ranking. So these were all mechanics that are used all the time in games, but as training designers, we can actually extract them as a kind of standalone mechanic and say, I'm going to apply this to just a quick activity I'm going to do. And I don't have to build this whole framework around it and make it a very official and formal game. I can use the mechanic by itself to really yield some great results. It sounds like an amazing mechanic to include for sure to, you know, uncover things that are just there lying around and we don't really know about. <laughs> so Cheers Absolutely. and thank you for that one, Scott. And hearing your experience again, knowing that you've been in this for a while, that we met back in 2019, and you're already, you know, going for things on gamification, instructional design, and so on. We would like to know if there's some form of a method, uh, some form of a series of steps, a process. So when you're facing a problem that you'd like to solve using gamification, game-based solutions, Essentially, what do you do? What are the things that you would be facing up next and, you know, to take that project until its conclusion, whatever that looks like? Yeah, great question. Well, certainly, I'm sure most uh, involved listening uh, in this cohort here know a about kind of a lot of the standard steps of learning and development and instructional design. So, so I certainly graft onto a lot of those. So 
needs analyses and learner interviews and you know stakeholder meetings, all, all of those sorts of things. But yeah, to your more specific point, there are some game specific steps I really do try to follow early on in the process. And so I usually would the, these three that I'm about to describe, I would try to put you know, either right alongside the needs analysis or perhaps even before to help me really get a framing for what we want to design here. So the three specific game steps I really like to follow are these. Number one, I try to think about my feedback rate. And again, you can apply kind of a larger instructional design perspective to this, but I I think it especially matters in a game environment. So when I talk about feedback rate, you know, think about the games that you play and how quickly you get feedback. Um, You know, when I was hiding behind that crate, I would get feedback very quickly in the form of shots fired over my head that I was doing something right or wrong. The amount and the rate of feedback in games is incredibly fast. When we apply that or consider, compare that to traditional training methods, feedback rates in those learning environments are incredibly slow. Think about our college courses, right? I would take a course, I would I would attend every week's lectures, I would maybe have, you know, a few essays or quizzes due, but then a lot of my feedback came from that end of the semester exam. That's an incredibly slow feedback rate compared to the immediacy of of a game environment. So when I think about the first gamified step that I apply is always thinking about what's my feedback rate? How quickly can I give my learners or my players the feedback they need? And so oftentimes this will be, again, right at the start of a project, meeting with stakeholders, subject matter experts and saying, hey, how quickly can we give people feedback? How available are you to provide people with customized responses or how quickly can we automate the feedback process instead of an end of semester or an end of week thing can we do feedback on a day by day basis if you're designing e-learning materials a lot of the systems i use will automate the quiz process to give you feedback at the end of the quiz but there are sometimes ways where you can actually give the feedback after each question and this idea of shrinking down feedback rates even on that level of i want to give feedback question by question rather than at the end of the quiz can be really really helpful The second step that I use when I'm I'm gamifying is decreasing my failure cost. And again, when you think about that Fortnite example you were describing, what is the cost of respawning? Zero, two seconds, one second to kind of get dropped back into the game. Games are really, really good about having very low failure costs because if you think about the game designers, their goal is to get you back into the game and playing as quickly as possible. Let's again compare that to traditional learning environments where for some reason, we think that we need to make people jump through these hoops to kind of get back in to reapply for a course, to have a cooling off period before they re-enroll in something. And that seems to me to be so backwards. If you have a learner that says, I can't believe I messed that up. I really want to go in and try this again to say, no, wait until next month when we're offering this course again, then you can come back. That really seems like an artificially high failure cost. So rather than trying to put limitations to how many number of times you can take a quiz, think about dropping those things down to say, take this as many times as you want. I want you to learn at your rate and fail as many times as you need to try and really cement this knowledge in. Decreasing that failure cost is a great step. And then finally, as a third step that I really like to follow, and again, try to incorporate this early on in my my needs analysis, is I like the idea of putting the hardest questions up front. And again, this this flies in the face of, I think, what we traditionally think of about good course design, but where you kind of build up and stair step. But I really like that idea of challenge people up front with something that feels really impossible. And that often is more engaging than we give it credit for. I tell this other story in my book about how very early on I was, I convinced myself that I didn't want to be a math expert and I didn't want to, you know, care that much about math in school. And my reasoning, my very, you know, silly uh, adolescent reasoning for this was my teachers already know the answers to the questions they're asking me. Why would I care? Why would I engage myself in trying to figure this out if they already know these answers? And it wasn't until I was an adult that I figured out there are math problems out there that haven't been solved yet. But there's actually reward money out there for can you solve this math problem? I wish I had known that earlier in my life to think there are things here that no one in the world has solved before. You might be the person to solve that. Now, obviously, in order to do that, you'll have to learn some some rudimentary things. But let's put that hard question in your brain up front, knowing that that's going to be where the challenge is. So the way that this expresses itself in, in some of my daily design work is I'm big on pretests. I'm big on test out scenarios. I'm big on the idea of, hey, you, rather than me teaching you this content, I want you to write down all of the impossible questions and the stumpers that you think we can give back to the subject matter experts. Because that's where I want your brain to engage with. I want you to be thinking in that kind of nightmare mode scenario of this is so impossible that no one's going to be ever, ever going to be able to figure this out. And that's what gets people engaged. 
That sounds like a very sound and good process. So engagers, think about this, perhaps incorporate it into your daily practice as well. Just a quick break before we continue. Are you enjoying this podcast? If you're listening through a podcasting app, please subscribe and rate us on the app. This will be of great help to reach more engagers so we can change the world together through gamification. And Scott, would you say that there is, I don't know, some form of a best practice, something that at least would help your projects go a little bit better? And, and perhaps you can talk again about nightmare mode or, or something else. <laughs> I don't know. What, what, what would you go for if I asked you this question? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, one of the, one of the things that, you know, kind of joked about this idea of nightmare mode in a couple of different areas here. One of the elements that I think is actually really effective from that concept is the idea of humor. And some gamification experts I've talked to, they, they almost treat humor as its own mechanic, which if that works for you, great. I think that using humor in any way that you can, can be really, really effective. I'm talking a lot with behavioral scientists and system thinkers right now. And so much of our world is complex, unknowable. And that means that a lot of our training efforts where we try to put something into a box or create a step-by-step -step process for it is you know, almost destined for failure because our, our world is evolving so quickly. And so that means we need to rely a lot more on improvisation. And that requires an ability to laugh at the absurdity of the situation sometimes. So calling something like a nightmare mode or kind of questioning, you know, are you sure you want to go out into the this, you know, brave new world or to skate along the, the cutting edge of this industry and know that you're going to fall off requires that kind of edginess of, yep, and I'm willing to, I'm willing to laugh yeah. at myself while I do it. That can be really, really powerful and helpful. And also again, decrease and unseat this idea that we still bring into training environments, which is I got to be a good student. I got to be perfect. I can't mess up in front of my peers. I love using humor to kind of unseat that. Amazing. Amazing. Just a, a, a quick shout out to, to make sure that when you're doing global work and you're involving broadly different cultures, humor can be a little bit more tricky. So just keep that yeah. in mind when you're yeah. using humor. I'm not saying don't use it. Just keep that kind of stuff in mind Absolutely. of cultural sort of localization for jokes yeah. and, and humor. Great point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, um, yeah, the humor that I see is to be, most, to be most effective is often that kind of more universal you know, let's laugh at something, you know, kind of not working on the screen and not, not really directed toward a, you know, yeah, like you said, an event or a, you know, something happening in the world, you know, let's, let's like distill kind of the humor and let, let, let's distill that down to kind of the shared, you know, collective comfortability with, with uncertainty and, and yeah, kind of recognizing that that is the true core of it. And it's not about, yeah, kind of pointing fingers or, or any of those things. Great point. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Scott, talking about recommendations, which you've given plenty of, does anybody come to your mind when I say, who would be a future guest that you would be curious mm. about for Professor Game? Yeah, good question. Um, just looking looking back through the amazing people that you've talked with on this podcast, it's I, I feel honored to be part of this group. And, you know, almost... I, I feel like I would go back through your list and say, everyone you've talked to, talk to them again. I would, I would love to hear kind of the latest <laughs> thoughts um, to go totally off off script and kind of in a, in a totally different direction with everything that's happening with large language models and AI right now. I think it'd be so interesting to have a large language model, uh, you know, chatbot, uh, GPT, Bard, you know, some one of these new kind of LLM types to be a, a interviewee on, on, the, on the podcast. I think that would be really fascinating. <laughs> so somebody on the machine learning, you know, this, this kind of uh, world is what you Yeah, either, either that or the machine learning algorithm itself, because we're, we're kind oh. of getting to be, to be so conversational at this point, I would be fascinated to know what does a large language model itself have to say about some of these questions. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Let's give a little bit of thought to that and see what we can whip up. <laughs> and, and keeping up with recommendations, is there a book that you recommend to this audience, The Engagers? Yeah. Oh, so many good books. Um, gosh, I feel like every every week or two, I'm, I'm discovering a new author, a new book, uh, sometimes an entirely new kind of sub-industry. One book that I'm, I'm kind of looking back to my shelf, and so there are certainly books that I've read and then gone out and gotten the, a hard copy of just because I know I'm in a dog year every page. One that's standing out on my shelf right now is The Theory of Fun by Raf Koster. Really, really enjoy that book. It's quick to read, has some really great kind of philosophies in there, and also has a great visual element, which which I really enjoy with, with a lot of the books that I'm reading. 
The other book I'd recommend, um, I think I read it earlier this year, but it's actually a, a fiction book. And so it's kind of far afield from what we've been talking about. But for those that are interested in game designs and especially the world of, you know, early, you know, computer and console game designs of the 80s and 90s. There's a book by Gabrielle Zevin called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. And it's it's just beautifully written and involves a lot of kind of the industry and the world of early game designers from decades ago. Really, really great book. So Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, three times. Is that right? Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, three times. Yep. Amazing. I had never heard of that one. Definitely uh, yeah. going to go Check it on out. our list for now. And, you know, we, you've talked about other people and it's things that they do great, right? So who would be somebody you would be interested in having? Well, actually, we're talking about somebody who's not a person, but you were also talking about a couple <laughs> of authors as well for books. What would you say in your case, Scott Province, what are you great at? What is your superpower? That thing that you do at least better than most other people? Oh, man. I... Uh, I uh, struggle with that one. I, th I think that so much of what I'm what I'm doing is is learning uh, at the feet of others and and standing on on others' shoulders. Um, man, uh, something something that I I appreciate with myself. I really I really like showing people how we can pretty much always in some way be increasing our success and our results. And and I think one of the superpowers I have, uh, and at least in a lot of my consulting work, is just showing how much we can measure and how we can take people from point A to point B and in some way get them to a better result. And so that can be everything from let's analyze your design time and try to shave some time off of that using some better mechanics. Let's look at your engagement metrics. Let's look at your culture boosts and, and your scores there. Let's look at your attrition rates. I even had one project where we came in and did a redesign and we actually got lower feedback scores from people. So they were saying, I liked this training less than other things that I've done, but we were seeing higher on the job outcomes. And we kind of realized that if we, when we dug down into the feedback, it was, I liked this less because it was hard and it challenged me, which <laughs> I didn't enjoy because I didn't like being wrong, but that helped me actually perform better on the job. And so even when we have these projects where we're seeing a dip in some areas, I really enjoy digging into that and sitting down with leadership groups and stakeholders and subject matter experts and saying, okay, that changed. Now, what else is changing that we might see? And is that a trade-off we're willing to give? And we, obviously in that scenario it was, yeah, let's let those feedback scores drop a bit because people are getting challenged and that's okay. Like we can have feedback scores in the 70s and 80s and not the mid 90s because that means people are feeling at the edge of their comfort zone. And that's a great spot for learning to happen. Amazing, amazing, love that. So Scott, We've gotten to this point where, you know, there's this question that some people appreciate, some people are scared of, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it, it would have to be, what is your favorite game? Ah, We're going to put yes. you to the fire here. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, you ask me tomorrow, it'll, it'll be changed. You asked me a week ago, it would have been different too. So that is certainly, certainly constantly changing. The one that's top of mind for me right now, and maybe it's because we, you know, I was just talking about kind of fiction books and elements of storytelling. I really enjoyed What Remains of Edith Finch, uh, and, and those that, that have played that always love talking with others about the enjoyment of that game. It was one of my first experiences with something that was called the game, but really was you know an interactive story. So there's, and I don't want to spoil anything, but there's less of, it's kind of polar opposite from that first person shooter I was describing my brother taking me through, you know, not a direct bad guy, not a direct threat of anything of bodily harm, but a deep exploration of humanity, of family, of storytelling. Um, and so a really, really interesting game to kind of counteract, contrast some of the the more traditional big name games that we've seen out there. Well, it sounds like an interesting one. I could tell you I had never heard of it before. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, good good we'll one to check out. see if I out. get a chance to play it. I have a, a <laughs> list of games I have that are literally inside their box. I've <laughs> never been taken out. I just, well, actually I did. I took them out installed them on my PS4 or on my Switch, uh -huh. and they haven't been played <laughs> yet. <laughs> yep, yep, you and me both. <laughs> it's, it's funny, those, those those memes that really get to me when I see them. It's like, when you're a kid, you have all these games you want to play, you can never get to them because you can't purchase. You're waiting for your parents <laughs> to give you a Christmas present or a birthday That's present. Right. And if, there's never enough, right? You, you run out of games in, at some point when you're a kid. <laughs> And now I have more games than I can actually get to play. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly <laughs> and, right. And, and of course, I play a lot less than when I was a kid. 
So, yeah. you know, it's a, yeah. it's a tough balance in that, that sense. It is the challenge. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, Scott, is there any final message you want to give to the engagers? Any final piece of advice you want no. to give us? Of course, also let us know where we can find out more about you before we take off. Yeah. Um, gosh, yeah. Quick advice. Uh, reach out and, and, and talk with people. Uh, you know, again, this... For those listening, maybe first time, Rob is an amazing uh, resource. Check out Professor Game. Check out all of the the people. I really think that this family of gamification experts, trainers, they're so giving with their time. They're so eager to bring that playful environment in. So, and I I certainly want to put my own contact information out there for people. So, if you're, you know, chewing over a problem, or if you just want to kind of sit down and have that informal talk networking and collaborating, I would say is some of the best advice I've received. And certainly uh, what I would want to pass on is don't design in the bubble and don't feel like you're alone in in your problems. We are all here to help each other. So really want to say thank you to everyone who's done that for me and, and certainly offer that to others. Amazing. And I think we've discussed this before on the podcast. I've mentioned it many times in my workshops because I, I tend to focus a lot on people who are getting started is, as you were saying, don't be afraid to reach out. I think this Uh is a wonderful community of very willing people, people who are willing to share as much as they can, as far as there's no legal limitation, which we sometimes (laughs) have with NDAs. But, you know, outstanding, you know, NDAs. Save for that, there is a lot to be shared, a lot to be consulted, a lot of community to build and to reach out to. So go ahead and do that. Take advantage in the best of senses of that, Engagers. Reach out. Scott has also had given away the way many ways to contact him. You can also find them on the show notes on Professor Game. Just type down Scott Province and you'll definitely find this episode. However, engagers, however, Scott, as you know at this point, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Hey engagers, thank you for listening to this episode of the Professor Game Podcast. And I have a quick question for you. How are you listening to this audio to this podcast? If you're doing it through any of the podcasting apps out there. Have you clicked on that follow, subscribe, whatever button looks like? Have you rated? Have you commented on what the podcast is like for you? If you haven't, please go ahead and do so. And if you have, thank you in advance. If you do this and you haven't already, we can you can help us reach other engagers like you to achieve this mission of making learning and perhaps even life amazing using game-based solutions and gamification. If you need instructions to how to do this, I have a couple of those at professorgame.com slash iTunes. And again, remember before you go on to your next mission, remember to do this, to subscribe, to follow, rate, and review this podcast through your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.